heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full earnings coverage ahead. From Google to Microsoft to Snap, we have got you covered. Plus, we'll take a deep dive into the current state of social media as Elon Musk unveils his grand vision to turn Twitter into X into a one-stop shop for financial services. Plus, we'll stick with social media and push ahead to Meta's earnings out after the bell today. How have those cost-cutting initiatives impacted the bottom line? We'll discuss it all. First, let's check in on the markets, though. And, well, it's a big macro day, Abigail Doolittle. It certainly is. Everybody's waiting on the Fed. And what will they do? It seems largely baked in that they will raise by a quarter of a point. But the big question is the future. Will they uh, be dovish or hawkish? So far, to my mind, they've been hawkish. The markets seem to see it the other way. The tech stocks right now are down. I think that has less to do with the Fed, though, and more to do with Microsoft. But first, uh, Google, that alphabet, having a great day, up uh, 6%. It's best day since February. This, of course, after they put up a strong quarter uh, ad uh, uh, numbers stabilizing on Google search. Microsoft, though, not so much. We've been talking about this over the last couple of weeks, Caroline. You have these big tech stocks that are up huge on the year. But the revenue growth, it's not really there. 8.3% for Microsoft, uh, really uh, a single digit there, not great. And you can see the stock down in response to this, the worst day since January. It's not all bad, though, Caroline. We do have the Dow, which I know we don't talk about the Dow a lot on Bloomberg, but this is a record winning streak up 13 days in a row. Uh, a small gain, but actually at session highs for the Dow, uh, the longest winning streak going back to 1987. The VIX right now for the S&P 500, well, it's up ever so slightly. And then finally, pushing it forward to earnings later today, we do have Meta, I believe, higher on the day going into that report. Actually, over the last five days down, so investors are a little bit nervous about what could be ahead. Why are they nervous, Caroline? Well, at one point not so long ago, this stock was up more than 160%. Will the results justify? This is another company where that revenue growth, it's less than 10%. I think it's 8 or 9% modeled for this quarter. Unless it blows it away, investors may not like that, similar to Microsoft. With that valuation a little bit cheaper, though, than the rest of the index, maybe one that can protect it on the downside. Great setup from Abigail. And let's dive into where she sort of set us up. Alphabet, Microsoft, some key movers on the benchmarks today. Let's dive into each micro picture. I'm pleased to say that Daniel Newman of the Futurum Group is here with our CEO. And Dan, it's always great to have some time with you. Let's dig into Alphabet first because it was a good set of numbers. Is this a relief rally or is this actually signs of progress and really AI starting to work in their favor? Well, I think there was a lot of concern when Microsoft first hit with ChatGPT, OpenAI, Bing. Is this going to start taking market share away from where Google makes its money. Mm -hmm. And so cloud, you know, was starting to make a little money and all of a sudden people are like, ooh, cloud's starting to make money, but is search all of a sudden gonna get hit? I think we saw with what they were able to do with DeepMind and Brain, getting their Palm model, getting, you know, uh, you know the search, generative search into market, Caroline, that effectively they're gonna be stable. And now you can see what happens today is people are looking at Microsoft and saying, was the first move truly giving them an advantage? Yeah, interesting. I mean, we, we understand there's reports even that Sergey Brin's come back into the fold, much more helping drive the AI focus for over at Alphabet. But talk to us about market share, particularly around cloud, because it feels as though Azure is the area that everyone's slightly worried about with Microsoft. That ramp up the double digits that we all got so used to, just cooling down a little bit. Is Alphabet taking any of that? Well, they're taking a little bit because you saw they had about a 28% growth this quarter. Microsoft was just a little bit less than that. And any time that Google outpaces Microsoft, it means small bits of micro, uh, market share. Now, having said that, there's a law of large numbers. Mm -hmm. um, Azure did re reveal some of its size, said about 110 billion in cloud, about half of that being Azure, I believe were the numbers they put out. So they finally revealed a little bit of what their cloud market looks like. I mean, Google's, you know, sub 10, 10-ish billion dollars this quarter in revenue uh, for the cloud business. So it's still a bit smaller. And so, you know, remember when AWS was growing, they're up to $80 billion in revenue at plus annually. These differences are hard to make up. So when you're young and you're growing fast, Caroline, having said that, I think Google has some momentum. I think their AI play is really starting to pay off. So they came in late, yeah. but people are saying, well, you didn't have to be early in this case because we're seeing how quick things are catching up. 
and whether they were technically late or whether they were just being more cautious about a rollout, realizing the power that they ultimately have in the in the overall community, their size, their scale. I'm, I'm interested in AI more broadly. It's interesting here in New York today, I think AWS is showing off its AI prowess. How much is AI going to drive cloud adoption more broadly? Well, it's going to be significant across the board. We saw Azure and then Microsoft with Dynamics 365 roll out some pricing. Companies like SAP, uh, companies like Salesforce, they're all saying, you want our best AI features? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to use our services in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so different companies like an SAP, you don't have a hyperscale cloud. So you have to use an Azure or you have to use an AWS. Salesforce, you have to use their service to get the best uh, you know, AI options. And we're seeing the market, you know, we've done some recent market forecasting in Carolina, we see this market growing by about threefold over the next five years. Um, what exact market? We're talking cloud adoption market here. We're saying the AI market. So we see about a $60 billion market right now. Um, our future group forecast for five years out, 2027, shows almost 180 billion. This is in hardware platforms, software. So this is a, you know, a 22% or so growth rate, which is big, but for how much AI, I actually think it's gonna be quite a bit bigger. And I think some of this forecast is, there's still a bit of conservatism. I think people are a little bit past the hype. Are they using the, the services? You know, I was using Bard like crazy. I was using GPT and I found myself, Caroline, over the last you know, couple of weeks to a month, almost like, I'm not using them quite as much. So has the luster worn off or now we're starting to see it applied into tools and that's where it's gonna really start to pay off in our CRM, in our search, when we're actually using these things for business and enterprise purposes. Dan, can you, when you're looking at modeling that out for the next five years, what are you using as price points? Like we're only starting to see what a Microsoft would charge if you're gonna adopt some of their overall being AI within the enterprise, 30 bucks a month additional. How are you seeing companies charge for this and how do you forecast that forward? Well, so here's the thing. The modeling is incredibly complicated because you have the modeling of things like hardware where we have quite a bit of clarity, whether it's an NVIDIA, mm -hmm. uh, Intel, AWS uh, selling you know, infrastructure. And then you have software where you have companies that are kind of saying, hey, we're going to give this away. You know, we're going to just include this because it's how we protect our moat. And then you had Salesforce that showed a really rich pricing and said, we have a ton of features across service, marketing, sales cloud, and you're going to pay a lot, but it's going to be very, very feature rich and it's going to be incremental. I think where Microsoft has a good play here is that they're going to be able to put all these co-pilots into every part of their business and they charge 20, 30. But remember, they have hundreds of millions of users. So even small incremental gains across their product portfolio are going to drive it north. So I think the reaction today, I mean, if I was an investor and I was looking at the reaction today, I would say it's a little bit of an overreaction, but look at how much the, these companies have run. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're resetting. We're saying this AI thing was a lot of hype. It's not only hype. It is going to be real. But in the long run, the way this rebalances companies' incremental revenue is going to take a little more time to play out. And when you looked at that five-year forecast, when you're thinking of, what was it, $180 billion being added, does that vindicate the sort of valuation increases that we have seen so far? Or do you think they've got ahead of themselves? I think the market is early, but it's very indicative mm -hmm. of where we're going. You can't possibly see tools like supply chain management tools, HR and hiring tools, and see how AI could help us get to the right candidate, you know, streamline getting product into market. Everything here is about productivity gains. And when you think about productivity gains, you think about earnings increases, and you think about what the market is driven by. It's driven by, can a company make more money in the future? All these tech companies have big bets on AI, and we're seeing kind of the winners get separated, the companies that are gonna lag in industries like real estate and oil and gas, that's what we're seeing from an okay. AI use standpoint, are gonna be the ones that are gonna be harder to invest in. So in every field, what investors need to really be looking for is which companies are gonna see these incremental and then exponential gains because they're gonna be able to put AI to use. And is it from Microsoft, from Alphabet, from Amazon that those sectors adopt from, or is it more bespoke focused AI tools that we're actually seeing more fun in the venture space right now? Well, I think it's going to be partnerships. So I think you've seen Jensen Wong of NVIDIA out announcing partnerships with pretty much every tech company. You see him out in healthcare. You see him talking with financials. And then, of course, he's partnering with hyperscale cloud providers, SaaS providers. You know, him and uh, Bill McDermott were on stage together at the ServiceNow event. I think there's a lot of collaboration. I do think vertical specific AI, Caroline, is going to be tremendously opportunistic because 
knowing real estate, knowing retail, you're gonna have to build solutions. There's too many options, too much optionality of how to build an AI solution. Mm -hmm. People are gonna want it in a box, just like we wanted CRM or HR management solutions. They're not gonna want to try to build it from scratch. And we've seen that change in just a couple months. Dan, great to get some expertise, thank you. I'm running on over here in a very hot New York, Dan Newman of the Futurum Group. Great to have him on site. Meanwhile, coming up, look, Snap plunging after its sales forecast disappoints. We're going to have much more next with Jasmine Emberg of Insider Intelligence. Plus, I mean, we've got to talk more broadly about the social media space. The giant that is Meta reporting earnings after the bell today. Yes, there's been the hype about threads, but what about the reality of their financial discipline? What about the clampdown on costs? We're up five tenths percent, as you see on the day. But remember, options really signaling we could see about a nine percent swing on their earnings after the bell. So we'll have to see where that volatility takes us. To the upside or the down? This is Bloomberg Technology. Product now. Samsung unveiling its fifth generation of foldable smartphones today, seeking to counter a sluggish market for devices and upcoming rival products coming from Apple. Samsung's executive vice president and head of customer experience officer, mobile e experience business. It's quite a long title. It's Patrick Chomet. He spoke exclusively to Bloomberg News in Seoul. Just take a listen. The fold is is designed for uh, productivity. We enlarge the ecosystem with a range of new application developers in the productivity domain. And um, the multitasking has improved with the, the taskbar. And that is because we have this incredible performance and AI capability with a new, the new processor. Samsung has this open collaboration environment or like a culture for Galaxy and like Google is part of it and Microsoft and Meta and like they all have some kind of agendas to have their own generative AI tools and now that Apple is joining the race um, is there any like Samsung's efforts to do it? So there is a lot of uh, intelligence and AI at play already in many parts of our devices. As I said uh, we are working with Google on the partnership for a long time, and we have a culture to uh, foster the innovation together. Chinese smartphone makers like um, Xiaomi, Oppo, and Huawei, they're all rolling out their own version of foldable phones with cheaper prices. Is there any chance that Samsung would like to provide more affordable prices for foldable users, let's say in India or China in the near future? Uh, some analysts uh, predict the market to grow beyond 100 million units uh, by 2027, in the next uh, three years. We do expect to capture a large part of the growth. Uh, right now, I can say it's a growing category, and what drives the, uh, the appeal, uh, the pool, is actually quality. It's quality and innovation. And is there a chance that um, you are going to add more feature about the flip uh, after the fifth generation. On the software and the experience side, we continue to improve uh, many, many experiences with our intelligence coming in uh, more. So there is, it's just the beginning, I would say. We are still at the beginning of a new era and we are very excited about the potential. Foldable phone is now about 5% of the market, we understand. Samsung's executive vice president and head of customer experience, that's Patrick Chomet, with Bloomberg's Sui Kim. Let's return now to where AI has perhaps been taking away a little bit from the bottom line. We're going to talk Snap right now, tumbling today after the social media company reported, well, second quarter results that gave revenue outlooks a little bit weaker than expected. 
even as it continues to invest in new ways you can be advertising on the platform. Let's talk about the earnings and more broadly about social media landscape. Jasmine Emberg's with us, lead coverage of influence marketing and social commerce at Insider Intelligence. Of course, you look at Snapchat, you also look at TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, now X, Facebook, we'll get onto all of them. But Jasmine, I mean, Snap always does this. It feels like it has a pretty volatile reaction to earnings and quite often to the downside. Is there hope that in the forward-looking future, we will start to see, well, benefits from the investments they made? Yeah, well, Snap is clearly not out of its revenue slump yet. And, and prior to earnings yesterday, I had said that its ad business wouldn't start to turn around until at least the second half of this year. And now it's looking like Q4 at the earliest. But despite the weak guidance for Q3, there were plenty of bright spots to look to in its earnings. Snap made all of the right moves during Q2. It worked to strengthen its user base, diversify its revenue streams, and improve on its ad platform. We saw a couple of positive signs already from those efforts including in the number of active advertisers as well as advertiser retention. But there's clearly still a lot of work to do and efforts to diversify its revenue streams through Snapchat Plus, for example, will take time to actually have an impact on its bottom line. Um, and my AI is where I'm most hopeful um, for Snap's business in the future because it really does or has the potential to give Snapchat access to first party data that it can use to serve more relevant content and yeah. advertising across its surfaces and potentially making up for some of those lost signals from Apple's privacy changes. Interesting that of course the subscription model therefore still to bear fruit. What's interesting is well, other companies have started to do subscription models and we think of the way in which Twitter now X is trying to monetize, trying to make up for some advertising weakness to the tune of 50%. What have you been making of social media more broadly, the competition, the fact that everyone seems to be on each other's toes? Can you just talk about X and, and the rebrand for a moment? What do you make of it? Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there's a ton of competition in social media. That's another reason, of course, why Snap continues to struggle. But with X and, and, and the rebrand, I mean, it was a massive moment for, for social media. It really, truly is the end of an era. I mean, Twitter is an incredibly recognizable brand. The word tweet is part of the public consciousness. But the writing was also on the wall here. I mean, Musk has been very vocal about transforming Twitter in into X. Um, I think the timing in some ways was right. You know, Musk is a master of media and he may have wanted his news cycle back. Um, but that, that's not to say that this wasn't coming. Uh, my question now is, though, you know, there's obviously a vision for X, but what is the strategy behind it? Does he truly have one? Because super apps, of course, are unproven in mm. most of the Western world, including in the US. Can you tell us a little bit about super apps? It feels like maybe everyone's trying to build them right now. I mean, of course, in the past, what's interesting about X is there's a real focus on payments that are going forward. And we know that Elon Musk, that's where he's made his fortune to begin with, was PayPal. But PayPal can never quite make the, cross that Rubicon in terms of actual banking services. You look at how Meta, originally Facebook, was looking at, at its own payments infrastructure and wiped that away. And then it feels like TikTok is starting to get in on the text-based communication as well. Is everyone eventually going to try and go for some sort of WeChat model? Well, it looks like everybody wants to do a little bit of everything, right? But with the WeChat model in particular, I mean, that is one that Musk has pointed to for, you know, over a year now. And yeah, the reason why super apps really haven't taken off in the US is one, you know, we have established habits. We are used to doing different activities in different apps, and it is incredibly difficult to change consumer behavior. There's also a lot of privacy concerns, especially when you move into things like payments and financial services. People have to hand over a lot of uh, personal and, and payment information, and they're not necessarily willing to do that, especially on a social media platform. In some ways, I understand the rebranding as Musk is trying to move towards this X vision of a super app because it does distance um, the company from, you know, the, the problems that did exist at Twitter before. But there's a there's a lack of trust in Musk itself himself, too. Mm. And X, of course, is a new company uh, or a new brand that really doesn't have that same kind of, of, of recognition. But they do actually have a CEO who's very well known within the spending marketeer area and Linda Yaccarino doing her best to, to navigate X as Elon Musk does appear from the outside looking in, very much still calling the shots. How much do you think just 
in general, we're at some sort of bottom when it comes to advertising sentiment here. Because I asked Ruth Poor at that of Alphabet, and she didn't really want to make any sort of call there. Well, the, one of the biggest challenges Linda Yaccarino was always going to have was balancing Musk's vision for the platform with what Twitter users and advertisers want. You know, it was never going to be an easy job, even for somebody with as much experience as uh, as Yaccarino. I think that early optimism that, you know, a lot of people had, including myself after her appointment, has faded um, and is mostly gone at this point. We can tell that, you know, Elon Musk is very much still, still calling the shots. And publicly, she hasn't said much more than applaud many of these changes and his vision. Of course, you know, the Twitter's ad revenue struggles are very, very well documented. Mm. Um, and there hasn't been much movement in a more positive direction. And it's going to be even more difficult to do so now. Insider Intelligence Principal Analyst Jasmine Emberg. It is such a busy space and you're always so clear thinking and click out about it. We appreciate it a lot. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Time now for work shifting, where we look at the changing landscape of the labor market amid advances in technology and well, we've therefore got to look at how the head of the largest U.S. private sector union, Teamsters, is turning his attention to e-commerce giant Amazon. Amazon is definitely going to be a target uh, to organize. We're going to take this historic agreement uh, and use it as a template to show the Amazon workers uh, what they will receive when they join the Teamsters union and we organize them. Well, this comes just hours after reaching a tentative deal to boost pay and benefits for hundreds of thousands of UPS workers. Plus, Google and Microsoft and OpenAI are launching a safety model for artificial intelligence. The effort called the Frontier Model Forum aims to consolidate the expertise of member companies and create new AI industry standards. Meanwhile, Ant is planning a restructuring. Now, the Jack Ma-backed company is looking to break off its blockchain and overseas units to pave a way for its revival of an initial public offering. And that's likely to be done out of Hong Kong rather than that dual listing that was initially targeted in Shanghai and Hong Kong. That, of course, comes over after a change of ownership that prevents them doing that in Shanghai for at least three years. Meanwhile, coming up, part of the Elon Musk grand vision to rebrand Twitter into an everything app includes pushing into financial services. We are just talking about with Jasmine Enberg, but let's talk about whether he can really succeed where some other tech giants have failed to really bring on board the banking services within a social media company. Plus, watching shares of Teladoc, look, this is the shares absolutely surging, well, a quarter of their entire market cap today, best move since February 2020. The virtual healthcare provider is raising the bottom end of its revenue forecast range for the full year. Analysts saying that that firm's control over its costs look it's bearing fruit, even as it faces a tough backdrop. So much more on earnings to come from New York. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Quick check on the markets because today is a day of macro data and decision making. You've got to be focused in on what's happening with the Fed, of course. Most anticipating there will be some sort of rate hike. The question is, will there be signal for rate hike come September too? Many feeling that that shouldn't be taken off the table in terms of an option even as we do see inflation start to cool. Nasdaq currently off by four tenths of percent in large part on the back of key earnings. Microsoft just pulling us a little bit lower. The Dow, I show it only because it's on its best run since 1987, folks, 13 straight days of gains. Bitcoin just up about two tenths of percent, but looks still languishing around 30,000. In fact, volumes are the lowest in 30 months in terms of spot Bitcoin trading, we understand. Moving on, and we go to some in particular earnings that maybe we've missed out so far. I mean, we haven't missed Alphabet, just leading the pack when it comes to the outperformance on benchmarks today, up almost 6%. Remember, new role being expanded for Ruth Porat as she looks for a new CFO, but takes the reins of CIO and indeed president. But most notably, this is a company that's managing to show advertising coming back, 5% increase in particular on that advertising juggernaut. We're looking at eBay, just up three tenths of percent. Results overall, some soft gross merchandise maybe was being anticipated, but we keep an eye on what's happening in terms of eBay and, and then look ahead to its own earnings coming a little bit 
later, we look at targets being raised ahead of them to $50 by Jefferies. In fact, that came yesterday. I'm looking at what's happening in terms of Micron. We're up two and a quarter of a percent. Now, Micron actually getting some strong talk coming from NVIDIA. Look, moves in terms of its memory chips could be advantageous. We understand some analysts signaling that this is looking brighter for Micron, particularly in its application to artificial intelligence. We're up to and a quarter percent, unlike the rest of the chip sector after Texas Instruments. Now, let's move away from earnings and go back to the billion, billionaire Elon Musk, known for you know, dabbling in different sectors. Aerospace, electric cars, of course, more recently, social media and AI. But he's rebranded Twitter to X, and Musk is vying to actually go back to his previous role as a banker. Bloomberg News finance reporter Jenny Serain has a great piece out, really thinking about the tough task X has to interweave financial transactions, maybe even banking. This is all about becoming a super app, but it's a tough space to get into. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. We've seen many, many tech giants go before him, um, and we really haven't seen much traction. You know, you have the likes of Facebook or Google, um, even Amazon, you know, where they've gone this path, it really hasn't been as successful as they, you know, might have hoped when they first set out. And it's just because banking is a really hard space. It's highly regulated. Um, the relationships that big banks have with their consumers are extremely sticky and, and hard to disintermediate. So um, Elon's got some high hopes here, and it'll be a really tough road to hoe to, to you know get to where he wants to get because ultimately look we've not only seen as you say the likes of alphabet sort of drop all plans to eventually add banking services we saw of course what happened with libra and the long road it took to get crypto interwoven within now meta and that didn't pull off but paypal i mean what ultimately elon as original x.com became they couldn't even offer banking services or wealth management right it's still a transaction company yeah no that's exactly right so it was about two years ago actually where paypal had set out on this big journey where they wanted to be that super app and they had a big ambitious goal that they would have 750 million users and um, they were going to be kind of the one-stop financial spot for consumers um, and two years on, you know, they have seen their stock tank, they've had to really retrench, they've had to focus on that core checkout button that kind of everyone knows PayPal for. Um, so it really just shows that even when you already have a background in finance, you know, it's really hard to kind of push that envelope and go into that next step. Um, and really a lot of these folks just end up having to stick to their knitting here. And as our resident fintech expert, as our banking expert, you'll know more than anyone that it's ultimately trust that they have to build. And not everyone at the moment feels all that trusting of whatever Elon Musk is doing in social media. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. You know, especially in the US, we're a very different market than say China, where super apps have actually taken off and, and consumers have shown this really um, big willingness to bank and do shopping and do their social media all with one company. We've seen it with Alipay, we've seen it with WeChat Pay. Um, they haven't had that same willingness here in the U.S. They seem to really like the fact that they get their banking services from a bank and they get their social media services from a social media company um, and they get their commerce from an Amazon or a, a retailer. So there's that trust piece and the, there's this really that willingness not to kind of cross those borders. They like those things to be very segmented. Um, and to your point, you know, Elon's not a name they know in banking. They know him as Tesla. They know him as SpaceX. So it will be kind of um, interesting to see if he can bridge that gap because it hasn't been done before um, really successfully here in the U.S. And whether Linda Yaccarino can do that as well. Yeah. Who, if anyone, would be the most to lose if X could crack this from a, like a wealth management? Is it, is it the, the online wealth managers? Is it the banks that lose out? Who really hurts? He seems really keen on payments. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I think PayPal, I think an Apple Pay, I think the credit card companies. Um, so I, I think payment seems to be what he's most interested in. It makes sense. It's the piece of finance that consumers touch every day. And so when you look at a tech company that just really wants to gin up usage, payments makes the most sense. And so, you know, in that, it's a very um, hotly competitive field. And so I think you'd see lots of, of pressure on different players, whether it's a bank or even a, a payments company like a PayPal. Well, many have learned that they're to their detriment to bet against Elon Musk, so we'll see whether he can cross this particular Rubicon. Thank you, Jenny Serain. Go check out her story. It's brilliant. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we'll talk about the unique opportunities in AI and legal tech, in fintech, in so much more. Canvas Ventures, Rebecca Lynn's going to be joining the show again. She's just had a successful exit, it would seem, with a portfolio company. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Time now for our VC Spotlight Prime Movers Lab. Well, it's raised $245 million to back young startups working on some unconventional ranges of technologies. The firm specializes in making investments kind of at the edge of what's technically possible, including brain implants, psychedelics-related therapies, space infrastructure. New funding brings its total assets under management to more than $1.2 billion. Let's get more on, well, the state of venture capital and some exits finally occurring. Rebecca Lynn, co-founder and general partner of Canvas Ventures, is a firm specializing in fintech, in artificial intelligence, among other things. And Rebecca, you've got 835 million in assets under management. And just now, one of your portfolio companies, Case Tech, sits in an AI legal assistant. It looks like it's just been acquired by Thomson Reuters for a, for a cool sum of cash. Tell us a little bit about why now we saw this sort of exit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really exciting to have sort of the, uh, the first and the largest all-cash exit in this recent uh, wave of AI. And it's been really exciting. I mean, Case Tech has been a company at the forefront of AI since we invested about six years ago and, and was working heavily on it even before that. And they had developed some really incredible technology even prior to GPT-4 involving parallel search technology that earned them a customer base of over 10,000 people. So because of that, they were invited to be in the sandbox very early on GPT-4 with OpenAI. And they launched this new product called CoCouncil in March. And within you know, 45 days, they added another 1,000-plus you know, customers using this new product. So you know, we've seen, um, we've seen you know, AI come a long way in a very short period of time. The delta from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4 was pretty incredible. Mm. So case, case text actually uh, tried to pass the bar with GPT 3.5, <laughs> and they scored sort of a measly 10% on the California state bar. Um, I took the bar years ago. I'm a lawyer as well, and I probably could still do 10%, I hope. Um, <laughs> and then when they, uh, when they launched uh, their new co-counsel product using you know, the fully featured GPT 4, they actually scored 94% on the California State Bar, which okay. essentially means that this product could stand in the shoes of a full legal associate. In many ways, it was ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 that got the whole world suddenly ignited and excited about artificial intelligence. But you have been investing in it for a long time. This is a company you backed years ago and continue to then see its trajectory. Will, are we in a hype cycle, or is it necessary that that had to happen to get this sort of level of sudden application of a case text, for example? Right. No, I, I don't think we're necessarily in a hype cycle. I think the technology just came up the curve to that last increment very, very quickly. So we've been, we've been investing in AI you know, since I've been in venture. Uh, at Morgenthaler, we were the first institutional investors in Siri. And just to see the evolution of how good AI has become since then. I remember, you know, product testing Siri in the early days, and, and it could understand, you know, very little initially. And then we, uh, we came into Figure 8, which was really the picks and shovels for AI. And that company was acquired by a public company called Appen. And then we did Luminar. And Luminar, you know, has AI at its core. They, mm. They're an autonomous driving company. And they, you know, reinvented the entire LiDAR stack and the AI software to go with it, right? So I think AI just suddenly had a leap forward in its capabilities, as we saw from the leap forward from GPT-3.5 to 4. How many public companies or how many ultimately big companies are desperate to start buying in this space? Was Dow Jones the only one out there who was wanting to buy Case Text? Um, you know, I can't comment exactly on the, uh, on the other um, possible acquirers. I can say that, um, that the company had you know, more than their fair share of venture term sheets they could have chosen from if they wanted to go ahead and, uh, and take an equity round. And then you know, Thomson Reuters was just the logical acquisition partner for this company. Let's talk, therefore, about the venture equity that still wants to get into AI and more broadly in the space. What does it look like? What are terms, what do valuations appear to you as someone who's looked at AI before it kind of got frothy? Yeah, so overall, you know, valuations are down, but for AI, right? So AI is, I would say, the most heavily invested, you know, sector right now. However, I think it's really hard to imagine an AI company starting from scratch right now and, uh, and becoming a big entity. I mean, what we like to see, I actually love sort of Series B companies, right? So companies that are late A or early Series B, and what that means is they have some semblance of product market fit. They're actually solving a real problem. 
and then AI can come in and really supercharge that uh, that initiative. And so, you know, for for me, I think the bigger opportunities leveraging a technology like AI are companies that have a unique data set mm. that already have a client base that they understand the use cases for quite well. And now they can come in and solve the problem in a much ro more robust and, and interesting way. So we're focusing a lot on that sector. And, uh, and we're seeing it in our own portfolio even, how, uh, how this new technology is really helping to, I guess, supercharge our current customers, uh, including companies like Skyflow and OfferFit and Kinetica that are all really benefiting from this new technology. Now, I'm not going to say which of your portfolio companies aren't managing to cross that AI void, but, but are there companies out there that are going to ultimately become obsolete? How are VCs in particular trying to ensure that their founders, their companies already backed can pivot where necessary? Yeah, I think you just they need to stay ahead of the curve. And so anyone who kind of got the press release on OpenAI and now thought they should do something or on GPT-4 is, is, is behind, right? And so, you know, the companies and the good companies that are out there have already, you know, been thinking about this and been incorporating uh, the benefits and the, and the, and the um, advantages of, you know, GPT-4 and have been way ahead of it. And, and we, were, we were just lucky to be sort of part of that, you know, having seen kind of what was coming, uh, what they were going to release with GPT-4. What about venture more broadly? Like, obviously, you've had the benefit of the odd exit just now, but IPO still remains pretty much shut for many people. People are feeling that there's a regulatory hurdle of big companies buying smaller ones at the moment. How does your industry look? How is it thriving or not? Um, I have never been more excited about our industry since I, I came into venture, really in 08. I, uh, I entered venture right when Lehman crashed, which I thought was probably the best time I possibly could have entered, entered venture. I think these kind of dislocations bring an incredible amount of opportunity, and that comes, I mean, I'm, I'm a fairly contrarian investor, I believe. But uh, we are seeing, you know, uh, early stage funding down, probably about 40 to 50 percent. We're seeing late stage funding down even more. And probably the most exciting thing for me is we're seeing uh, the Series Bs, which are always the hardest round for a company to raise. Mm -hmm taking longer than they have in 12 years to get their funding. So the time span from like a Series A to a Series B uh, investing round is about 31 months right now, which is longer than, you know, really I can remember on record. And on top of that, uh, when you look really under the covers of what's happening, about 40% of the Series A and B rounds happening that are happening right now after taking 31 months are actually being led by insiders. So mm. people that are already investors in the company that are trying to uh, support the valuation that they currently have, which in many cases is, is too high. And so for us, what that means, you know, where, because of where we invest, uh, we have a lot of time to look at the companies and to make our choices, which is ideal. What about coming in as a new investor? So if you're not just as some are many, just being the insider that backs a company that's already in your portfolio, but wanting to come in and write checks to new companies. What do the terms look like? How much control do you have when you're that person looking from the outside to get in? I think right now, when you're, it's definitely a buyer's market, right? When you're looking at the outside to get in, you have more time for diligence because of just it, it, the time that it's taking. And you can pretty much set the terms. We are beginning to see uh, something we haven't seen in a long time, which is down rounds, right? Mm. When I did a lending club and the depth of the credit crisis in Q1 of 09, it was actually a down round, which, which ended up quite good. It was the largest U.S. tech IPO of 2014, right? But in that climate, that, you know, most of those companies that were being funded were actually down rounds. Um, we're seeing companies being recapitalized. So in other words the new investor coming in and really cleaning up the cap table and funding that company for the go forward. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough market when companies are raising, uh, raising rounds right now, I would say. Canvas Ventures co-founder, general partner, Rebecca Lynn, talk about the tough, but also the opportunities and indeed, uh, congratulations on one of the exits just now. Thank you for joining us. Meanwhile, coming up, Look, more tech earnings. We're going back to the public market. We're getting into meta results. That's coming after the closing bell. More on what to expect from Mark Zuckerberg's empire amid cost-cutting efforts. And of course, the launch of Threads. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology.
we are making sure we develop and deploy AI technology responsibly so that everyone can benefit. Last week, we signed on to joint commitments with other leading AI companies at the White House, building on the principles that have guided our work for many years. To take advantage of the AI opportunities ahead, we've been sharpening our focus as a company, investing responsibly with great discipline and finding areas where we can operate more cost-effectively. Alphabet CEO Sunil Pichai there on the company's earnings call discussing AI, the responsibility there from not only driving revenue but ultimately building it ethically. There's another company that's about to go viral and it's Meta out with its second quarter results after the market closed. And Alex Marinka covers that social media more broadly for us. And Alex, remember last time on earnings, you were really showing how much time basically Mark Zuckerberg took to talk about AI rather than the metaverse. Are we thinking the same thing again? That's right, it was six minutes last last time on AI and 30 seconds on the metaverse. I expect that might be the same, but what I think the street will actually be paying a lot of attention to is the health of the core business, the social media businesses. Maybe not the bright, shiny objects of AI, the metaverse, or perhaps even threads, but how is Instagram, how is Facebook doing, and can this company actually come back to revenue growth? You'll recall that last year, Meta actually posted its first ever year of of revenue declines. Growth was around 2% last quarter. Analysts expect about 8% of revenue growth this quarter. When does that change? When do those double digits come back? I think that's what the stock will move on, though I'm sure the executives would love you to focus on the big ticket spending items like AI, AI mm. infrastructure, and the excitement around threads. I mean, it feels like pretty optimistic. I'm looking at the EM function on the Bloomberg right now, and they're seeing double digits in revenue growth back for their fiscal third quarter. So we only have to wait one more. But to that point, how much are we seeing perhaps talk of an advertising bottom at the moment? I mean, Snap was ugly, but Alphabet showing much more resilience when it comes to people wanting to spend on search. And I think Meta will probably fall somewhere in the middle. So Snap was ugly, and they typically do brand ads where brands are talking about kind of their brand name, their upper funnel ads. Search ads, where Alphabet is really strong, those are ads that are really high intent. A user goes to search for something, then they buy something. There's a direct impact on the marketer's bottom line. Meta kind of falls somewhere in the middle and has a bit of both. So that's where we kind of expect it to fall. Stabilization has kind of been the name of the game across across a lot of the digital ad uh, industry. Uh, Meta tends to move a little bit closer with Alphabet uh, because they're the two kind of duopolistic giants in digital ads. So if there is stabilization and if that, uh, if we see any kind of guidance like, like analysts are expecting toward double digit growth into the third quarter, that will be a really exciting move. But if we get more bearish signals from Meta's executive team, perhaps on the call, then investors could have a little bit of frustration with some of the more fun things that Meta's been talking about lately. Like Llama 2, whether that's ever going to drive revenue, certainly not, and well, threads when they start to turn on any advertising around that. Alex Barinka, brilliant as ever. Thank you ahead of those all-important earnings. And meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Do not forget to check out our podcast. Do not forget to tune in when the earnings come at 4 p.m. We'll be there with the Meta numbers. But of course, go for our podcast in the interim on Apple, Spotify and iHeart. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology.